there any bill introductions? All right, seeing none, we'll move on. Today we are uh, honored to have Connie Owen, the director of the Kansas Water Office, to come in and give us an overview, and primarily for the new folks, but for the rest of us, a good review never hurts anything. So uh, with that, Connie, if you would, please. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you very much for having me this morning. It's good to see some of you that I haven't seen since Garden City, so it's kind of a fun reunion this morning. Um, my name's Connie Owen. I'm the director of the Kansas Water Office, and I will be giving you a brief overview of the role of our office. And I will also mention at the outset that last session, um, I gave a couple of more extended presentations, if you want to look those up at some point. The dates for those were February 16 and March 23rd, if anyone wants to go back on YouTube and check those out. And let me make sure that I have my slides up. I do. Thank you. Um, Josh Olson in my office is helping with slides this morning, so I'm grateful to him. Okay, let's get started. The Kansas Water Office is primarily the planning and coordination office for all things water for the state of Kansas. We're not a regulatory agency. We don't permit anything. We don't enforce anything. But we do um, planning and outreach, and we coordinate with those agencies that do have the regulatory authority. We also are in charge of public water supply um, systems, and I will get into that more in just a little bit. The slide that you see, I'm not going to go into, but you can see a list of all the statutes that um, come into play with our responsibilities. So beside, despite my brief description this morning, our responsibilities really are very broad and expansive. Next slide. The agency mission of the Water Office is to provide Kansans with the framework, policy, and tools developed in concert with agency partners and stakeholders to manage, secure, and protect a reliable, safe, long-term statewide water supply. So that is our very broad, very important charge. One of our flagship duties is to develop and implement the Kansas Water Plan, which I will also talk about more in a few minutes. Next slide, please. An overview of our agency's responsibilities. Our two main programs fall into the categories of water planning and implementation and public water supply. The water planning and implementation has the three major components of the Kansas Water Authority, water planning and drought monitoring, and the public water supply um, Programs help provide water, municipal, industrial, and in some cases, irrigation and recreational, to citizens of our state. Next slide, please. Of those three main duties under the planning component, we have the Kansas Water Authority, which is an advisory board that is largely appointees of the governor. However, there is also an appointee of the president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House. The map that you see represents all the voting members that are on the Water Authority. They represent particular interests throughout the state. For example, um, Association of Conservation Districts, the public, Rural Water Association, Environment Conservation, and large and small public water suppliers among them. Next slide, please. This slide also describes the voting members of the Water Authority and who, um, what they represent and their appointing authorities. The job of the Water Authority is to advise the legislature and the governor and the Water Office on the priorities for Kansas water issues and programs, as well as funding priorities for how our money should be appropriated, how the state water plan fund should be spent 
to help implement the water programs. So it is, um, these are unpaid positions. These are purely um, public service positions, but they represent um, stakeholders and grassroots throughout the state. Next slide, please. The Water Authority is also made up of ex officio members. These are our experts. These are the state um, leaders in all the different water agencies who provide the expertise and the knowledge and the information on which the voting members can make their important decisions. They are included in the conversations. They're a very integral part of the Water Authority and their advisory duties. Next slide, please. The second main component of those three components under water planning is our water planning program. And to do this, we develop the Kansas Water Plan. It's something by statute has to be updated periodically. And it addresses, identifies all the water needs of the state, whether it's water supply, water quality, you name it. And so, as you can imagine, the list is incredibly long, and we are currently updating the Kansas Water Plan. The new version should be available very soon. It is quite a voluminous document, as you might imagine. It is informed not just by the Water Authority, whose job it is to actually approve the final version. It is also informed by our regional advisory committees. And what you see on this slide, the map of the state, identifies our 14 regional planning areas. Each one of these areas has a committee of people who get together and identify the water needs in their particular areas, what they think should be done about them, and they prevent or provide goals and action plans to the Water Authority and to um, the legislature and the governor through the Water Authority as to what they need and what they think should be done about it. Their goals and action plans are also being included in the update of the Kansas Water Plan this year, which is um, a new development that hasn't been done before. Next slide, please. The third component of our planning program is drought monitoring and response. The Water Office is responsible for monitoring drought and notifying the governor when drought conditions exist. We coordinate with a variety of other agencies to um, keep the information up to date and to keep an eye on what's going on in the state. We rely on the U.S. Drought Monitor, which is updated every week, and we post that on social media. There is also a drought response team, which the Water Office is responsible for notifying the governor if it's time to, to convene that team to issue a new updated drought declaration. Next slide, please. The other of the two main jobs of the Kansas Water Office, the other one is our water supply program. And this has to do with the various reservoirs throughout our state. The federal reservoirs that exist in our state are owned by the federal government. The Kansas Water Office contracts with the Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Reclamation. We pay for storage space in those reservoirs. And then in turn, we contract with entities throughout the state to provide municipal and industrial, and in some cases, irrigation and recreational water. So th this system actually supplies two-thirds of the water supply of our entire state. Next slide, please. The three different mechanisms through which we'd handle these contracts are through our water marketing program contracts, water assurance districts, and an access district. So I'm not gonna go into the details of what makes those different, but those are how um, we, we handle those contracts to provide water supplies to municipalities and industries throughout the state. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, the Kansas Water Plan. This is really our flagship responsibility and developing it and then more importantly, implementing it. And we will be moving into the implementation stage and that is going to be um, more exciting today than it 
might have been before since we have more hope for our funding. Um, the Kansas Water Plan is divided into five priority areas. Conserve and extend the High Plains Aquifer. Secure, protect, and restore the Kansas reservoirs. Improve the state's water quality. Reduce our vulnerability to extreme events and increase awareness of Kansas water resources. Next slide, please. By statute, there is a fund dedicated to help pay for the programs that are identified in the Kansas Water Plan. And this is called the State Water Plan Fund. This was created in 1989. The graph that you see in front of you identifies the various sources of revenue that go into the State Water Plan Fund. There are a variety of fees that are paid um, from related to pesticides, fertilizers, clean drinking water fee. So most of the slide at the bottom, those are the colors that are reflected in those fees, but of primary importance and um, excitement today are the top two colors, the green and the purple. Those represent two statutory demand transfers that are supposed to come out of the state general fund every year. And by statute, $6 million is supposed to come from the state general fund, and $2 million is supposed to come from the Economic Development Initiatives Fund. The last time that was fully funded was 2008. Next slide, please. The gray area here shows the funding that did not happen. So we are in arrears approximately $80 million. It has been um, very difficult to say the least to help pay for water programs to provide safe, secure water for Kansans without the funding needed to implement the programs. So it was very exciting last night to hear Governor Kelly recommend that the full funding be restored, that the full $8 million be restored to the Kansas um, State Water Plan Fund. So that was very welcome news to those of us in the water world. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the cover of the Kansas Water Authority's annual report. This was delivered to your mailboxes yesterday. Every year, by statute, the Water Authority, with the assistance of the Water Office, puts together an annual report that fundamentally explains all the programs that are paid for out of the State Water Plan Fund and that are recommended to be paid for. And so that's kind of a really good encapsulated um, document to have once you are diving more into what does the water plan um, recommend, what does the funding pay for, and what do those programs do and what do they mean. I think uh, Chairman Highland has asked me to come back another day and dive into that a little more specifically. So with that, I will wrap up my comments and Again, thank you for your time today, and I stand for any questions. Thank you, Director Owen. That was very good, quick overview. Uh, a lot to take in for the new members, but uh, I wanted them to hear in general. And then she gave you the dates. Remember, you go back down to the S drive and find those two dates, and they'll be the full presentations. But uh, are there any questions? <laughs> I had one and I forgot it already. But we'll get to them as we go. I'll be here if you remember it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, next on the agenda is an update on the uh, from the uh, chief engineer, Mr. Earl Lewis, Division of Water, Kansas Department of Agriculture. Welcome to the committee, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It's uh, good to see you all again uh, back at Topeka. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, come and talk to you for a little bit. Hopefully we do we got a presentation coming up here um, that'll kind of go over what our responsibilities are and give you a little bit of an update. Uh, again, appreciate the opportunity last year to come and talk to you. So uh, be somewhat of a refresher and you'll probably see some some slides that are, are um, familiar. Um, 
And again, uh, appreciate the opportunity to just kind of lay out what it is we do uh, as an agency, um, what our responsibility is, and, and uh, how we go about uh, accomplishing our missions and, and, uh, and working with other state agencies as well. So um, the, the D Division of Water Resources um, is in charge or has charge of, of roughly 30 different statutes or pieces of 30 different statutes. Uh, the biggest one, the one that gets most attention is Kansas Water Appropriation Act. We're going to come back to these uh, again in just a little bit. But we cover primarily water rights, interstate compacts, and then water structures. So things like dams, levees, those kind of things. We, unlike the water office, Connie mentioned they, don't, they really aren't a regulatory agency. That's our primary purpose. Division of Water Resources is, is primarily and first a regulatory agency, again, dealing with, with permitting and, and compliance and enforcement. So where do we, we sit? We're within the Depart Department of Agriculture. We're a division. Uh, and so uh, I, as the, the head of that division, report to the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, there's also, obviously, Conservation. Division of Conservation is one that deals with water quite a bit. And I know that uh, last year uh, the committee heard from Andy Lyon, who's the, the director of the Division of Conservation. And, of course, we've also got a number of other ag-related programs, animal health and marketing and those kind of things. Uh, but we sit within Department of Agriculture and, and report to the Secretary of Agriculture. Our structure within our division is we have three primary programs. And again, you've kind of heard me mention how we're broken up. Lane Letourneau, who many of you know and is sitting in the back of the room here, uh, heads up our, our water appropriation program. And again, the, the primary focus of that is on uh, the Water Appropriation Act, uh, dealing with water rights, dealing with uh, our re interactions with the groundwater management districts, uh, the local enhanced management areas, intensive groundwater use control areas, anything to do with water rights, water use, water appropriation in the state of Kansas fits within our water appropriation program. Uh, we have a water management services program, which does two things. It is our technical services program within the division, so they do a lot of the, the modeling and a lot of the GIS work and a lot of the heavy lifting on the technical side that supports our other programs. But they also uh, serve uh, the state and, and, and me and our commissioners when we have interstate uh, compacts and interstate issues. And so uh, there's four interstate issues we're going to come back to, or four interstate compacts. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But those are our service by our water management services program. And then finally, our water structures program uh, oversees and deals with dams, levees, channel changes, uh, those kind of things. So again, a primarily regulatory agency uh, and regulatory program. We are headquartered out of Manhattan. Um, again, with the, the headquarters of the uh, Department of Agriculture, we do have four uh, primary field offices that, that cover, as you can see from the map, different areas of the state. One here in Topeka, one in Stafford in South Central, one in Stockton in Northwest, and then one in Garden City in Southwest Kansas. We have uh, one employee down in Parsons at a satellite office that covers that area, um, really housed within our, structurally within the Topeka field office. Uh, but it, again, we have, we're trying to spread that out and get folks more, um, you know, closer to the issues and closer to the folks that they're, they're helping out. So the, the slide up here, and again, you'll have a copy of this uh, in the drive that the, the chairman was just mentioning just a little bit ago, but list out the primary statutory, um, the acts that, that we oversee and which of those programs those fit in. Uh, and so I won't go through each of those, but you can you can see uh, how they fit organizationally and also when they were put in place. Uh, and so we talk about the Appropriation Act in 1945 and so our compacts, uh, our water structures program goes back to 1929. Uh, so that's really the, the oldest um, acts that we the administer. Uh, the Division of Water Resources actually became an entity within the Department of Agriculture in 1927. And it was a, had a predecessor agency that was an irrigation commission uh, that was charged at that time in 1917 with trying to promote irrigation and, and uh, a lot of the, the ditches that were starting to, to come into play in western Kansas and in South Central. So we're going to talk a little bit about water use and water appropriation. Oh, we went too far. Sorry about that. I'm not sure. Okay. So. Uh, this is a map that we use uh, quite frequently and is just a good summary map that shows where water is used in the state of Kansas. And so for each county, there's a pie chart. Uh, and that pie chart, the bigger the pie chart, the more water is used in that county. 
And so you can see where the majority of our water is used in the state of Kansas, in southwest Kansas, south central, northwest, uh, and the, it, those are color coded. And so the, the blue is irrigation. And again, you can see that's the dominant use in the state of Kansas. Uh, any given year, 83 to 85% of the water use in the state of Kansas is for irrigation. Uh, Eight to 10% is for municipal. Then we get into industrial, stock water, and then on down the, on down the list. Uh, you can see the yellow is, is industrial. So if you look at where most of those are at, uh, those are in the cities, but they're also, the biggest slices are probably in our power plants. So you think about Jeffrey or Wolf Creek or, or any of those that are, are large power plants, they take a lot of water primarily for, for cooling. Uh, and that's where a lot of our industrial use is at. Uh, and the, the red is municipal, and again, it's no surprise. You see Wichita, Topeka, Johnson County area, those are where we have the biggest municipal water use. So again, a lot of this is pretty common sense if you stop and think about it for a little bit. So we, if we look at how we developed over time, uh, this one's going to loop through from, maybe it is, it's not. Okay, if, it would really look good if it worked. Um, but it's supposed to loop through and show kind of the development over time. So hopefully when you get the, the, uh, the other version, it'll kind of show where the points of diversion have changed over time. The key here is it, um, you'll start to see a lot of development, again, in southwest, west central, where we have the groundwater areas. And in recent years, we're starting to see more and more development in the eastern part of the state. We used to think of irrigation as a western Kansas issue. We didn't have hardly any in eastern Kansas. In recent years, we've started to see a lot more development of irrigation in the eastern part of our state, especially in northeast Kansas. So uh, it's something that we're trying to, to make sure we're, we're looking at and being proactive so that we, we don't run into some of the issues that we're now facing in other parts of the state that we're, we're more thoughtful on the front end. We want people to be able to use the resource and develop it, develop it. We also want to make sure we're not getting into a situation where we're creating impairments between water rights or we're utilizing the resource. That's, that's kind of the balancing act we have to do. So if we look back to, to again, Western Kansas, uh, one of the things that, that our folks, along with the Kansas Geological Survey, do every year is go out and measure roughly 1,400 wells across the state of Kansas and track that over time. Uh, and one of the products the Kansas Geological Survey then can to look at is knowing how deep the aquifer is, knowing the water level, how fast it's dropping, how long do we have left before we don't, before our economy is going to change that's based on that, that irrigation. And so we look and say, at what point in the future do we expect that we won't have water levels satisfactory to support a 200 gallon a minute well? Uh, we used to think of 400 gallon a minute uh, as kind of the threshold when we start to see a lot of change in our, our irrigation economy. Now we think it's more like 200 because of a lot of the irrigation technology. It's kind of a double-edged sword. We can get by with less, but it also means when we have less water, we can still be productive. And so you can see, that there's areas where, uh, and again, it's color-coded based on how long we have left. If we're, if we're in that brown area, we really don't have enough water supply left for a 200-gallon-a-minute well. If we're in the, 20, uh, in the red, we're about 25 years left. And then on up, where we get into the yellow, we're more than 100 years of supply left. So we've got a lot of variation in, in western Kansas when we think about it. It's one of the issues we face when we talk to folks. Uh, about our water issues in western Kansas because one size doesn't fit all. Not everybody's in the same situation. Um, they may be all be using from the same aquifer, but if you've got 25 years left, you're more worried about it than you've got 150 years left, and we should be too. Um, so that's why we've got to be, be thoughtful about how we approach this um, and also make sure that we're, we're tailoring whatever actions we take to the situation there in the local neighborhood. We do still have the ability in some areas, I mentioned we're, we're getting some development in eastern Kansas. We still have some areas that are open for appropriation. One of the, I think, misconceptions is the state gives people water rights. The state doesn't give you a water right. You develop a water right. It's a private property right. The state gives you the ability through our management of the resource to develop that water right. And so that process is that if you wanted a water right, you come in, you file an application uh, for a permit. We look at it, make sure that you're not going to impair other users in the area. And if, if there's water there and you're not going to impair other users, then you will issue a permit for a number of different beneficial uses. It's then your job to go out, drill the well, put in the pump site, put in whatever system you need, uh, develop those diversion works. Then we will inspect those diversion works to make sure that they're in compliance with all the requirements of the permits in whatever area you're in. You put that water to beneficial use. 
and however much water you put to beneficial use is then how big of a property right you develop. And so it's actually a property right developed through use, not granted by the state. It's the state's responsibility to manage those property rights and manage that development, but it's really the individual property owner's uh, actions that lead to a water right to be developed. So if we look at the areas that are still open, uh, really any of the purple area is closed to new appropriation at this time. The cross stretch area is, is limited, or there's a lot of there's a lot of restrictions there that that limit that area. Any area that's in the that really isn't uh, cross hatched or or have the purple color to it is still open to appropriation. Doesn't mean that there's water there. Uh, you know, water right doesn't give you access to water. It certainly gives you an opportunity to access water if it's there in priority. Um, but those areas are still open to new appropriation. I do want to hit on a couple of the the tools that the legislature has put in place here over the last decade that I think have been really good tools and, and a lot of folks are using them. Uh, out, of the, out of the drought of 2011, 2012, 2013, we had the multi-year flex account. We had a lot of folks that were challenged with, with staying within their water rate limitations because of a very severe drought. We think about it from the standpoint of a groundwater situation. Um, in a lot of ways, that's more like a savings account that you're using than than it is your checking, if you will. So if you have to draw on that over time, you're gonna, you're gonna take that down. But if we look at that from the longer term, then we can balance that use over a five-year period and let folks maybe use a little bit more in a drought year, but then pay that back. Again, like you'd put more money back in your savings account, you use less in another year to balance that out. And so we don't let people use five times their authorized quantity, but we say, what has your use been? What's a reasonable use for this area? That way people can manage their water right over a five-year period rather than an annual period. And we've seen historically when, we, when you have folks do that, when we let, let irrigators manage over a five-year period, they use less because they want to be conservative and they want to make sure that they don't know if that drought's going to happen in year four or five and I want to make sure I have water when that comes. And so in the first few years, if I don't need that water, I'm going to be more conservative with the water because I'm going to bank it a little bit myself. So multi-year flex account's been a really good tool. Uh, we've got a number of people that are using that, and we'll provide you all with a report required by statute to provide a report each year, and we'll get that to you here uh, before the end of the month that kind of lays out how many people are using that. Water conservation areas are, came into play in 2015, um, and it's, it's an individual opportunity for um, an individual producer or a group of producers to come together and cut back on their use, but we provide some flexibility to use water differently maybe than they have in the past for the restrictions are changed, but again, they typically over a five-year period, um, and they can kind of combine some of their wells, gives them some flexibility. In return, we get some water conservation. Uh, they use less water, but they use it more efficiently. And again, typically what they see is an increase in their profits, we see less water use. If we look at that on a bigger scale, the local enhanced management area went into place in 2012, um, and the first one was being in Sheridan County. That uh, has been, we just are in the second five-year period for Sheridan County, and they've asked for it to be renewed. That was a, an area that reduced their water use by, the goal was 20% reduction. The first time they reduced it by more than 35%. Uh, again, there's been economic studies that show when you give them flexibility over a five-year period, given the tools, uh, people actually made many times more money inside the lima where they were using less water than they were outside. Uh, so these flexibility tools, along with conservation, are really pretty powerful and, and really give the, the farmers an opportunity to save some water. We now have, in Sheridan County, in, in all of the Groundwater Major District 4, which covers northwest Kansas, and this year is the first year, uh, actually we're, we're entering the second year of the Wichita County Lima out in Representative Minix area. Uh, and so I know that there's talk uh, in his area there's that GMD1 in west central Kansas covers five counties. And so there's talk now about uh, having those other four counties in a, in a Lima. Um, and I know there's some, some public meetings going on, maybe even this month, um, with hopefully a goal of having something submitted that would be effective for next year. So again, this is, um, we're making progress slowly but surely, but I, I wanted to say thanks for, for the tools that you all put in place uh, that really led to us being able to, to make this progress. Again, our interstate compacts, um, we're in, we're in probably better shape than we've been in a long time. We're not ensuing anybody right now, which is always good. Um, we are, have good relationships with our, our sister states. We have four compacts. The one that gets, the two that get the most attention is the Arc River Compact with Colorado. 
that gives us water in southwest Kansas, the Republican that covers parts of northwest Kansas and north central. Uh, those are ones that we have both sued Colorado and then Colorado and Nebraska uh, over the last uh, 30 years or so. Uh, we've got a compact with Oklahoma on the Ark River and then a compact with Nebraska on the Big Blue that comes into Tuttle Creek. Those we've never really had any true issues with. We're in good shape on both of those. Uh, we continue to work with, with our sister states on, on the others where we've had some trouble in the past. Again, we're in pretty good shape, but we're, there's still some issues to clean up and we continue to work with them regularly to try and resolve those remaining issues. Uh, one of the biggest issues we hear a lot about, uh, certainly on the Ark, is water quality. Uh, with, with uranium and sulfates coming across the line from Colorado. Um, that's n one of the questions of, is water quality covered by that compact? Of course, Colorado says it's not. We'd say maybe under certain conditions it might be. Uh, but we certainly want to be working with them because the going to a litigation approach maybe doesn't resolve the issue the way we need it to. We need, it, we need to have actions on the Colorado side of the line by individual farmers. Um, changing their irrigation, changing the fertilization practices. Um, that's really what's going to result in better water quality coming across the state line. And so we're continuing to work with them um, and trying to find ways to work with federal government on that as well. Um, so that's overall, the, the, the news is good, uh, even though there's still some issues for us to work on. Uh, our water structures, uh, again, the, the biggest piece of that is our dam safety program. There's 6,000 dams in the state of Kansas that are on the National Inventory Dam. Uh, roughly 2,500 of those are regulated by the state of Kansas. And so think about a dam you know, as you're driving around seeing some of those medium or larger dams. Those are ones that are regulated by the state. Certainly the Corps of Engineers, Bureau of Reclamation uh, are, are regulated by those federal agencies. But if we think about watershed districts and those or city lakes, those kind of size are the ones that are regulated by the state of Kansas. We classify those not only by the size, but also by the hazard. And so if that dam were to fail, what's going to be the, the consequence downstream? And so if, it's, if we've got habitable structures, we've got a road that's traveled quite a bit, that's a high hazard dam, we pay more attention to those because the risk of failure um, is going to cause more damage downstream. If there's maybe um, you know, a shed, but nobody can live in it, a low traveled road, that's going to be a significant hazard. And then uh, a lot of them, really the bulk of our dams in the state of Kansas are low hazard. They really, if they, if they break, um, they're really not going to cause any trouble uh, outside of maybe some pasture, some farm ground, something like that. And so that's kind of how we look at that. There's inspection requirements that go along with that. And certainly uh, that gets a lot of attention because those inspections can be pretty expensive. We also run the national... Uh, delegated by FEMA to run the National Flood Insurance Program in the state of Kansas. And so we have over 400 communities that participate in that. And again, the, the er emphasis there is to try and identify those areas that are going to flood uh, when we have a 100 or 500 year flood, and then make sure that if you've got a house that's in that area, you have access to flood insurance. Uh, that, that's, a, again, a double-edged sword, because if you don't have never seen your house flood, but the, the analysis shows that it could, you don't want to pay that insurance premium. But when that flood comes, you're going to want to have the coverage to get the money back. So um, that's one that is a little contentious at times as the maps change, we get better information. But certainly uh, trying to make sure that we're thoughtful on the front end, keeping people out of harm's way, and, and again, getting them insured if we can is, is important. Uh, again, the other piece of that is levees and channel changes. And the numbers you see are just from a recent year, how many permits there were for channel changes, people uh, working on stream banks, removing the channel, uh, putting in levees, putting in dams, those kind of things. Uh, and so, again, it's more we try and be thoughtful on the front end and, and get folks permitted right so that we have problems on the back end. One of the things we talked about uh, last uh, year, and I wanted to make sure and hit on again this year, is, is how much money goes through the visual water resources and, and what's the source of that. And you can see uh, recent years numbers, uh, roughly 10, 11 million dollars uh, per year. A good portion of that is the money that comes from FEMA that goes then mostly through pass through to go to consulting firms that work on a lot of our flood insurance and those kind of things. We get a good portion. Um, you can see the blue, we get right about $4 million a year from state general fund. Again, that's primarily for salaries and wages, uh, office expenses, those kind of things to run our regulatory programs. And then we have 
uh, fee funds, um, paid for permit fees, inspection fees, those kind of things that pay for a part of our salary and wages. And then finally, as, as Connie was just mentioning a little bit ago, uh, we also get some funds from the State Water Plan Fund for our interstate water issues uh, team, some of our water use uh, database work, and then also some of our what's called sub-based water resource, which then supports a lot of those water conservation or LEMA projects. Um, that's what that staff does. Again, those are roughly staff and then operational expenses. Just wanted to hit on real quick uh, some of the kind of the hot button issues that you may hear about or may have heard about and kind of where we stand with that. Um, the, the biggest three we, we've talked about here pretty consistently over the last year or so, Wichita Aquifer Storage and Recovery Project has asked for some changes to their permits. Uh, that's going through a hearing process that we'll uh, hopefully have um, finished up here shortly and be able to to issue an order um, and then see whether uh, both sides agree with it or want to sue us over the order. We'll, um, we'll see how that plays out, but we're hoping to get that wrapped up here in, in the near future, at least from, from this stage. The, uh, the Hayes R9 transfer, again, City of Hayes has been searching for water for a number of years, went clear back into the 80s. Uh, in 1995 or 1996, they and, and City of Russell purchased the R9 ranch, which is in Edwards County down by Kinsley, about 70 miles south. Uh, had about 42 circles on it, uh, about 7,000, Seven, a little over 7,000 acre feet of authorized quantity. And now they're going through the process of saying, I want to take that water and, and move it 70 miles north to the Hayes and Russell area for a more permanent water supply. Um, there's a Water Transfer Act that, that governs that. The first piece of that is for our office to look and say, if it was not being transferred, if we were just changing those water rights from irrigation over municipal, could we do that? And the, the initial decision was, yes, those could be changed to municipal. Uh, there's a local group that doesn't want to see that happen and so has sued us over that, that order. That's been going on for some time. We're waiting for the district court to rule on whether or not the order was done correctly, saying that the, the water rights could be changed, uh, assuming that the, the district court judge agrees with us. Once that ruling comes down, uh, then it starts the transfer process and this public interest findings process. There's a panel of myself, of Connie and Leo Henning with Department of Health and Environment um, that would then sit on that panel and there's 10 statutory questions we look at and say, is it in the public interest to leave the water where it's at? Or is it more in the public interest to let the applicant move the water, in this case, Hayes, to Hayes and Russell area? Uh, so again, we've been waiting on the district court to, to give us a ruling for some time. Um, and so once that happens, then we kick off the water transfer process. Statutorily, that runs from anywhere between eight and 20 months. Uh, but to add up all the different um, time frames and notices, that's kind of the time frame we're looking at. So uh, that's probably something that my guess will take off at some point this year. Rattlesnake Creek and Quivira, certainly down in representative Fairchild's area. Um, the uh, last year, I think, as we I was here, we had just been sued uh, along with federal government by Audubon of Kansas. Um, the uh, the lawsuit was dismissed. Uh, we were dismissed out of it, as was the federal government. Audubon is appealing the dismissal of the federal government. Uh, they are not appealing the dismissal of the state as uh, a, a piece of that litigation. And so um, we'll see where that goes tomorrow. Actually, so in the meantime. The Groundwater Management District has been working with Natural Resource Conservation Service, or NRCS, on what's called a watershed program to look at the feasibility of augmenting the flow in the Rattlesnake Creek, so taking some groundwater, pumping it into the stream during those critical times when the stream flow is not adequate, um, and looking to get some federal money to backfill that, not only for the study, but also for the, the implementation of that. Uh, the, over the balance of this year into January of next year, uh, the groundwater Management District has hired a consulting firm, Olson and Associates, out of out of Nebraska to look at the feasibility of that. And there's actually a public meeting um, on that tomorrow, kind of early in the process, so we can get some feedback on on make sure that um, the study looks at all the different things it needs to look at. Again, we're going to make sure to do this, set this up right on the front end, so that if the augmentation is approvable, um, and ultimately they would have to file applications for that, just like a water right application. Uh, with our office, we'll have to make a determination on that at some point. Uh, we want to make sure that everything is covered on the front end and everything is evaluated on the front end so that when it gets to the permitting process, we're not 
uh, going to be a hiccup. Uh, we want to see that be successful. Um, so we'll see how that plays out again. Uh, the, the plan is that that feasibility study will run through December or January, so the next 12, 13 months. And then finally, um, you know, I know you heard last year from the groundwater management districts, each of them need to have a management program that kind of guides their, their different uh, activities. Uh, this last, and it needs to be updated every so often. This last year we approved uh, groundwater management district four update to their major program for Northwest Kansas. And actually just last Friday, uh, we approved groundwater major district three's program in Southwest Kansas. Uh, so that'll, they'll take that to hearing and assuming that there's no significant changes from the hearing, then that'll become uh, final. And that's something we've been working on for a number of years. So that's a, a big step. Uh, forward. GMD5 was, was before my time, but just a few years ago they updated theirs. And I know in, in GMD2 and Equisped, that, that south central area just north of Wichita, uh, they're talking about updating their major program this year. So again, making progress on, on working with the GMDs and, and their major programs. So I think that's um, all I have, unless you all have questions, and I'd be happy to answer them or, or yield back the time. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Any uh, questions? Representative Gore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lewis, for your presentation and your thankless job. <laughs> I do have a question on the uh, interstate water compacts. I think Nebraska's made a lot of news this week. They have. Um, would you weigh in on that? Is is there is that going to affect well, it us? It shouldn't affect us. Um, so what Nebraska, and I, and I did have a chance to talk to the Nebraska City Engineer yesterday about that. Um, he called me after they did that, not before. but. Um, which is which is okay because it really doesn't involve us. It, it's on the South Platte, which comes out of comes really out of North Denver, if you will, area, and then and then flows across Northeast Colorado into into Northwest Nebraska. Uh, and there's a compact between Nebraska and Colorado. And obviously, I don't know the the details as well as our own compact, but uh, the way that Nebraska's engineer explained it to me, there it's kind of a unique um, provision of that compact that that in order to access part of their allocation, they've got to build this canal that's actually in Colorado. Um, and they started on this, co this uh, canal maybe 100 years ago because it got held up when, when World War II started and never got re, you know, restarted after World War II. Um, but the, they're looking at spending, the, the governor of Nebraska said, as much as $500 million, the compact gives them the opportunity to go and secure land, even by eminent domain in Colorado, to uh, put this canal in place. And so uh, they know, as I think you all are aware, just the amount of developments and the water use that's happening in Colorado, they're going to be sucking up every drop they can in Colorado for the front range development. Nebraska's pretty worried about that. They see that, uh, I think he said that there's almost $10 billion worth of planned water projects in the South Platte in Colorado, and so they want to make sure that, that they don't de facto lose their allocation because they didn't take action. And so they're going to be uh, working to, to get that canal built as well as some storage, I think, in Nebraska that would make sure that they can utilize their, their allocation. Thank you. One other quick question. Uh, how many reservoirs do we really have in the state of Kansas? Well, it kind of depends on, I mean, if you go clear down to the farm pond, I mean, there's really... I don't, I'm talking about the larger ones. Well, there's, there's 24 federal reservoirs. So, 24, basically. Yep. All right. so there, and so there's 17 that are done by the Corps of Engineers, another seven by the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, there's a you know, couple of, of larger ones, such as like uh, primary earth power plants like Lacine and Wolf Creek. Um, so, you know, those are probably on the larger side, so we get up 26, 27. Uh, but the majority of them that we deal with, obviously, are kind of in that, again, that watershed district or municipal size. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions? Representative Vaughn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Lewis, for your presentation and all the work that you do. Um, I just wanted to quickly follow up on your last point about the GMD management programs. Um, could you talk a little bit about the general criteria or guidelines for the development of those programs and then how often they're updated? Well, there, there's really not... Um, criteria. I mean, the, the statute, the Groundwater Major District Statute uh, or Act really says that they have to, to adopt a management program that then guides the activities of the district. Um, so the constraints really are only within what the authority 
uh, given to the groundwater management districts by the act itself. Um, and so they vary quite a bit, as you might expect, from one district to another on their complexity and, and the issues they're tr trying to address. Uh, but they are supposed to identify what are the water resource issues that their district is, is concerned about or was developed for, and then what are the activities they're going to undertake in order to address those activities. Um, there's not a, a hard and fast guideline on how, how often they're, they're updated. Uh, some of the districts want to do that about every five or six years. Some of them we haven't done since the 70s or 80s. And so, um, you know, I, I give them credit for wanting to take a look at that and, and updating them. Uh, but it's certainly something that we have talked about internally is like, as we look at those, what are we really looking for? Because ultimately we have to approve those um, before they can, they can adopt them as their program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions? Uh, are committee members online? Do you have any questions? Seeing none. Mr. Minix. Representative Minix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an out to start with. This is an impossible question. <laughs> Last summer, after our meeting in Garden City, I, I remember uh, an economist, I believe his name was Mr. Smith, at the Finnup Center, talked about the value of water and economics, and especially up in GMD 6, uh, or the uh, Lima up in that mm -hmm. area and how things work. Correct. As a finance economist myself, I, I want to know what the value of water is for the state of Kansas. It's a resource that we have, uh, we can check appraisals and see what the, the entire total value of land in the state of Kansas is and lots of other things when we look at things. When you're talking about $10 million projects, sounds like a big number, but I think in comparison with the true value of water to the state of Kansas, what it brings to our economy, um, I, I, it's too big of an elephant to tackle so I tried to take some small parts and when you consider recycling water coming out of one of your industrial mm -hmm. if you went back to your Pac-Man chart the, the initial use of that water was industrial but I'm, I'm guessing as that water continues through our state it, it has more additional value to it as it goes along so it, it's a difficult deal but has anyone ever tackled that question I don't think anybody has tackled it you know, in total, certainly in, in pieces, uh, folks have tackled it, uh, and you're you're exactly right. I you know I think um, you know water is is you know obviously I'm biased here, but is a horribly undervalued resource, um, not only in Kansas but everywhere in the world. Um, so I mean, if we we have looked certainly at, at the question of what does it add even to say Kansas corn, um, and we're talking about billions of dollars. Um, but then you take that, where does that corn go to? Would we have the ethanol plants? Would we have the dairies? Would we have the feedlots if we didn't have that corn and, and forage supply that's primarily supported by irrigation? I think the answer is probably no. And now you're talking about another five or six billion dollars um, to the Kansas economy. You know, I think the one that we struggle with the most, um, you know, I think the, the Corps of Engineers does a fantastic job of valuing the flood control portion of our federal reservoirs and being a, when we have a, a large flood event they can say because we had Tuttle Creek we saved 100 million dollars this year whatever the number is for that year they do a great job what we don't do a great job of is saying looking at the other side how big how, how much industry would we have in the state of Kansas how big would our communities be if we didn't have those reservoirs that Connie talked about serving two-thirds of our population how big would Topeka be or how big would Lawrence or Manhattan be if we didn't have, or Wichita, if we didn't have our reservoirs to supply water. It'd be much, much smaller, right? Um, and so I think that's what we really, really struggle with, is how do you piece that out and say um, how important that water supply is to just the, having the basic, um, you know, economy that we have. Um, I don't, I, it would be significantly smaller, but I, I don't know that anybody's really tried to to tag that completely, I, I agree, because you gotta look at, you know, the value of water in Garden City versus in, you know, in Overland Park is night and day, right? Um, Garden City's gonna be a lot more valuable than it is in, just because it's a supply and demand issue, right? 
Thank you. You did very well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've had practice of not answering questions that people <laughs> ask. <laughs> Like a good question for the economists at K State or KU. We'll put them on that. Uh, I had one uh, technical question. Is uh, do you have the dates of when you gave your presentations? I, I forgot to get that. We'll get those and, and get those to you, or and get those to research and then make sure that it gets out to you. So that the new members can find those you bet. dates when you gave their longer, more in-depth presentations. Any other questions? Mr. Lewis, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming. A uh, little housekeeping for the new members. I believe it was in September after we came back from Garden City that I put together an overview of what the committee's done and so forth and shared that with all the other committee members. I'll get you a copy of that. So it'll give you a real quick overview of where we are in the process. It's not. Uh, I'll have to check. I'll, I'll check, see if it's there, but I'll make sure you get a copy of it. Uh, anything else for the good of the committee? Seeing none. We are adjourned. Thank you for coming.